lie, Julie. Please, it was the accident. I knew all about accidents. And let me give you some advice. When you leave a man for dead, make sure he's really dead. <laughs> Happy 4th of July, and welcome to this week's episode of Two Guys in Some Horror. In this week's episode, we're doing a really fun 4th of July film. The song that you just heard is is kind of a good hint before I drop the name, and before we get into things. But this week's episode is a classic tale of morality and a cautionary tale for all. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Clark. How you doing this week, bud? I'm good, man. I'm outside right now, so if my uh, if the wind's getting in the way, just let me know. No, everything sounds great. You sound great. Glad to hear you, your voice. You sound great, and I don't know if I've ever told you this, but your voice is very comforting to me. Ooh. Puts me in a little lull, and I'm ready to talk about I Know What You Did. Last summer. Mmm. Perfect. So this film, obviously, uh, is from 1997. We are doing I Know What You Did Last Summer. It is the typical 4th of July movie in my head. Every time I think about it, that's the period of time that pops up to me. Uh, I'm going to run through the director, writer, stars, budget, body count. Um, and then Clark and I all start breaking down the story and having fun with it. So director of this film is Jim Gillespie. Um, I tried to look at what he's done. I didn't really see anything that stands out to me. I don't know if Clark, if you noticed anything that looked good after this. With uh, the director, not that I know of, not to the top best of my knowledge. I, hey dog, yeah, no. <laughs> Perfect. So then we had uh, for our writer, we've got Lois Duncan, who uh, wrote the novel, but then Kevin Williamson, the great Kevin Williamson, uh, took that and created a screenplay. And some interesting facts about that. So in the book, all the characters actually live, and the backstory to what happens is that there's a car accident which gets explained in a lot more detail throughout the book. Um, and the movie is basically only only like just the title to the book. That's it, because the teens come clean to the police in the book, and then the movie, that's just not how it works out. We all know that. Um, Kevin Williamson also wrote this script before we actually get Scream in 1996, but he was unable to sell the script. Nobody wanted it at the time. So following okay. the big screen success of his next screenplay, which was Scream, Columbia Pictures immediately was like, hey, I got to have this thing. We need to make this thing happen. So that's super interesting to me. Um, let's see. For it's, stars. It's really a, kind of to, re to reflect on that. It's really interesting to see how nobody wants your stuff until one day somebody's like, oh, no, 100 percent. And yeah. then they just chase you. Yeah, I mean, Freddie Prince Jr., like, just to allude on that a little bit, I was watching an interview with him, um, and they asked him 20 years later about the movie, and he's like, you know what? I actually auditioned to be um, Billy in Scream for Kevin Williamson, but I didn't get the role. The casting director didn't pick me. And Kevin Williamson kind of leaned over to him and was like, hey, don't worry about it. You're going to be a no I Know What You Did Last Summer, uh, which we'll be releasing after this movie. And Freddie Prince was just like, well, dude, I've auditioned like five times for Scream. Why didn't you just tell me I'll be in the other movie kind of a thing? And it's like, give me a shot, man. Just like, let me be somebody. And and instead of getting in Scream, he ends up landing. I know what you did last summer, which really helps start his career. A lot of these stars started their career here in this movie. You have uh, Jennifer Love Hewitt, Sarah Michelle Gellar, Ryan Philippe, Freddie Prince Jr. Um, it's probably uh, Freddie Prince Jr.'s uh, best and... Uh most meaningful role to be frank in his uh, whole acting career. Yeah. I mean, he's got a really weird list of stuff that he does. He was, you and I talked about this when we watched the movie together. He's that heart, typical heartthrob, uh, late nineties, early two thousands. Um, but I think Clark and I had a little bit more fun when we found out who Bridget Wilson is. Um, <laughs> because she actually is Veronica Vaughn from Billy Madison, which Clark and I both gelled over instantly. That Veronica Vaughn. And then you also get Johnny Galecki playing Max. Um, and we'll get some more information on him. But those are basically the stars of the movie. Um, there is one star I'm leaving out, but we'll get to her information later because um, hers is a little more, uh, I think, interesting as the, the movie plays out. Um, I think you're leaving two stars out, to be frank. Two of the, the leading roles. Okay, who do you who would you also add in there? No, 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 no. You're fine. I'm I'm saying we got Sarah Michelle Gellar and then we have Jennifer Love Hewitt, right? Yep. 
I already started with them. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. That's I didn't the, know that. Yeah, they were the first two on the list. <laughs> oh, my bad. Boo boo. <laughs> BB. All so, right. So the budget for this movie was seventeen million, which is quite a bit. Um, our body count's pretty low, actually, with only six deaths. So uh, we'll break those down throughout the story or throughout the synopsis as we get going through this. And uh, and yeah, so I'll get you the like the story, the quick story, and then um, Clark and I'll just start having a conversation about different points. I'll bring up, walk us through the entire movie, and we'll just talk about the pieces as we go. So the main story for this movie is that four young friends bound by a tragic incident are reunited when they find themselves being stalked by a hook-wielding maniac in their small seaside town. Thanks, IMDb. That's probably the most simplest way to put that entire uh, story because at the end of the day, that's all it is. Tragic accident. Um, they didn't do the right thing, and, and now they're going to actually have to suffer through uh, some, some maniacal crazy man coming after them. And... We start the movie with that beautiful song that we had at the beginning of the episode, which is the Summer Breeze cover, and David Keegan sitting on the cliff set, uh, or sitting on the side of the cliff. And for me, Clark, that really sets the mood of this movie. It really gets you in that kind of um, sorrow, moroseful mood. I don't know how it how it set the mood for you. When you got a kid who's just kind of moping, flicking his silver, yeah, you can spinning really it around. Tell. You can really tell he's sad. He's something, you know, something's got him down in the dumps, basically. Yeah. Well, so, he, he's, uh, got, he's got that kind of hillbilly look to him. He's got his uh, overalls on. He's looking around. He's got kind of a goofy haircut. He looks like he's poor, you know, or they're trying to portray him as poor, but, you know, they did a – the makeup's obvious. But anyhow. Yeah, I'd, I'd say they're definitely pushing – pushing a specific design for him. They, um, you know, we meet the friends, um, Helen Shivers, which is Sarah Michelle Gellar's character, is uh, trying to be some fancy, I don't even know what it's called. Um, but basically, she's trying to win the beauty pageant. There you go. In the small town that they're in. Um, which most of this movie shot in North Carolina, which is actually pretty cool. Small town uh, of North Carolina. And uh, so, so it's a small town feel. And one thing that Jennifer Love Hewitt pointed out was, um, you know, a lot of people go to small towns to escape horrors or horrific things that could be happening to them in other towns or other cities. So for them, when they film this in a small town, um, they thought it was pretty groundbreaking and different um, because they felt like, you know, usually this kind of stuff doesn't happen to small towns. Um, and the fact that it is such a small town and you have no idea who it is, is pretty, pretty frightening to her. So I thought that was interesting take on it from her. Really? Yeah. I, I, I agree with you there because most horror movies happen in small towns. Yep. I mean, look at scream the year prior. Um, that was a very small town. You've got some great films. Friday out there. the 13th. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Uh, one of the smallest towns you'll see in horror films. Um, it's, a, it's a camp. And then you have... Uh... Haddonfield <clears throat> from Halloween. I mean, that right. that's not portrayed. It's a very large town. It's a pretty small town. Everyone lives together. The sheriff knows everyone by name. You know, I mean... My I, bloody I Valentine. Know. It's very interesting to hear her take on that because I just felt like it was kind of wrong. But, um, I mean, I for her, you. she was pretty young when she did this movie. So give her some credit. She might not have had a lot of... Uh, horror history or horror knowledge or something like that. You got to promote the movie in the best way you can, right? And I think that's what she was doing, was oh, promoting the sure. movie. For sure. Those interviews, by the way, they're only about a minute and a half, and it's just like them being interviewed on the set while filming. And you could totally tell it's just marketing PR, basically, um, to try and push the movie. So, yeah. So fast forward a little bit, and we get them debating about spooky stories, um, specifically one spooky story uh, while sitting on the beach drinking. Um, and to me, that sounds like a great camping trip. I already told Clark we're doing this. He actually said he's inviting himself to my camping trip, so you know it's going to happen. We're going to go out. We're going to start a little fire. We're going to drink a bunch, and we're just going to share scary stories. It's going to be amazing. Um, and if you donate to – I'm just kidding. Um, there's no Patreon for that. Uh, two fun facts about this scene, though. Uh, one is the group goes to a place called Dawson's Beach. So that's obviously a reference to Dawson's Creek. 
which was written by Kevin Williamson. Um, the other piece is that despite the part or being part of the main cast and, and them all appearing together in so many scenes, key scenes specifically, um, there's two characters that only talk to each other twice in this entire film. Can you guess who those two characters are, Clark? Is it Freddie Prinze and Sarah Michelle Gellar? That is correct. Um, so Helen and Ray's characters, they only speak to each other twice. Once is here at the beach and then once later on in the film. Um, and it's funny because, as most people know, Gellar and Prince actually became good friends after meeting on this film, later fell in love, and then got married. So the fact that they only had, it's like less than a minute and a half total worth of dialogue or something, but they're in the film, you know, the four of these main characters are seen a lot together. They just never talk. The next time you watch the movie, check it out because it's really interesting once you know. I wonder if we get a hold of the original script or if that's out there. Uh, we could actually see how many scenes they actually put the the two of them in that they just kind of cut out in post. Yeah, how much left on the how much got left on the cutting room floor? So for sure. So at first you might think that this is a bit of a don't drink and drive kind of social statement, um, but they make it very clear like Ray was not drinking that night. So um, I don't know. It's more I think to me it's more of a morality thing and like doing the right thing even if you might get in trouble kind of a situation um because i mean at the end of the day like david keegan that's you know that's a tragic story um and there's a lot of information i, I mean not we're not going to get too spoilerly right now it will be later on um but that poor kid i mean if if they hadn't have you know thrown his body into the the ocean and all that maybe he wouldn't have died um wink wink nudge nudge clark huh 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the yeah. the only time that they actually didn't film in North Carolina was right here during this scene when they're um, driving around that curvy road. That there's no curves or hills in North Carolina. It is one of the flattest uh, states. So they actually relocated to California for that scene um, where they run over the man. And what? Where are they supposed to be located in the the film? I know it's a small town, but what state? North Carolina. Okay, so there are no – well, that's very true. There's no real hills in Louisiana and Mississippi, so I would assume that to be the case with most of the southern Bible Belt. Yeah. So the producer, Eric Fig said that North Carolina was the flattest state and they needed more curvy and dangerous-looking road. <laughs> so they went okay. to California, which is great. Um, you know, and, and to me, just being like a regular movie-going, watching person, I, I, I always fall for the – Oh man, they must be filming, you know, in some studio or oh, okay, this scene must be shot outside and then they bring it back in, but I didn't even realize they were shooting in North Carolina for the longest time. I thought it was just kind of a, you know, a, a, a small town in California that they found that looks kind of like it, but no, I mean they if you look at the shots like around the college, when Julie goes home, that kind of stuff, you can really see the foliage is accurate to the area in the country where they're actually filming. Speaking of Julie going home for college, so she goes home for college break and then immediately she's receiving a note telling her, I know what you did last summer. Mm. Oh, that point, wow. That's the title of the movie. At that point, don't you think she should pack her shit and get out of there and head back to college? Like, I wouldn't stay around in town. Oh, man. Let alone what she goes on to do. So if she had left, the killer would have been... He still would have gotten his revenge, but she would have been dead. Oh, man, dude, I I disagree. There's there's some very interesting information later on, but uh, I think I'm going to bring it up now. So all four of them were in the car, right, when they hit the dude. Um, all four right. of them, in my opinion, are guilty of throwing the bodies or throwing the body, right, in the, in the ocean. One like, count of manslaughter, right. another count of, uh, yeah. Once you start throwing away a dead body, you're kind of, yeah, you're SOL unless you got money from yep. daddy. So one of the, one of the pieces of, of like the facts that they, that that's, that's out there is stating Helen and Barry were the only two of the four primary characters responsible for the July 4th cover up hit and run. And like instantly I'm like, no, how, how is it just Helen and Barry? Like, Ray and Julie's character, in my opinion, are just as guilty. Just because they were the two more moral of, of the group. Like, they were still there. They didn't 
call the cops or leave or stand up to their friends. They just bent over. No one is innocent. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So someone tried and... to state that that's why Julie and Ray, you know, don't meet their demise in this film. Um, are we are we going to discuss any plot twists and beforehand, or are we going to kind of go over like the body dismissal later, like all the details there? We'll go in, I think, more details there for now. Uh, we'll leave it as is. Like David Keegan was who they hit and you know dumped over the side of the the pier or whatever. Right. Um, and then and then they the camera kind of focuses on something that was left behind as well. Yes. Hmm. Do you want to talk about that? No, I no, I think we're fine. Okay. But that, that's like, oh no, here's a hint. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I mean, this whole movie, it's very, it's it's the way Kevin Williamson writes too. I think the scripts is, it's just super red herring, red herring after red herring after red herring, which is great. It's the old classic who done it. Um, there's a moment when I was writing notes that I started to write, hey, this is the Scooby Gang, because uh, it was Julie and Helen, Sarah Michelle Gellar and Jennifer Love Hewitt both researching I, in the library <laughs> we watched this together and i was like this is fucking scooby-doo yeah. but it was unrelated because it was the way they were all dressed up they had their make makeup on and the fact that you mentioned earlier that it was the same guy who wrote this is the same guy who did dawson's creek is very telling yeah very telling same with scream same guy i mean it, he has a he has a very specific stamp i'd say on on his work <clears throat> so when Julie goes home, she gets that note. She decides to go and visit Helen's sister looking for her number. So she assumes that Helen has gone on to New York to become some big model or actress or whatever she wanted to be. But sadly, Helen hasn't even left the town. She just works over in the perfume aisle, 10 feet to your left. And the store actually that they used for the film um, that says the Shivers you know, logo on the top or whatever, it's an actual store in North Carolina. It still looks very similar to this day. You can pull it up on Google Maps and check it out. Um, and all they sell is a mixture of clothes and home appliances. So like we talked about, if they're, I love going to places that have been used in horror films. I think it's a lot of fun. This one's actually a pretty good one. You can go stand outside uh, Shivers if you want to in North Carolina. So the girls then decide to go to Barry, who then accuses Max of being the note giver. He then decides to scare him. And then they run into Ray on the docks, get a little red herring, and after that, we get our first real kill of the movie. What did you think of Max being impaled in the throat with a hook? It's more of the, it's not the impaling, it's not how he was killed, it's none of that. It's where he was killed, and the amount of people around, just, she, <laughs> one of our characters witnessed this happening. And she's like, they're killing him, they're killing him. Oh my god, they're killing him. Is that is that's what we're talking about, right? No, Max, not Barry. So oh, Max, Max is Max. Yeah, Johnny Galecki. Oh, I forgot all about him. Oh, it was that forgettable. I forgot all about him. Yeah. Oh I, no. He had such a forgettable role in this film that I He did. He did. Uh yeah. I mean the murder wasn't even supposed to be in the movie. It was added after reshoots. It was only there because the director actually felt like um the murderer is never a tangible threat to the main characters. So if you remove that kill, you don't get a kill till like an hour into the movie or so. Um, right. So, I mean, in, in reality, they needed to add something that makes you think like the main characters could get hurt. So that makes total sense. And since it's an afterthought murder, um, it probably is a, a bit rushed, uh, be a, a bit too easy. This is in my opinion, the one kill where it's like he wasn't in the open. You know, he killed Max down in the, the little fishing dock room or whatever. Well, Max was, to be fair, there briefly on the scene, but he didn't really do anything. So it's kind of... Nope, he shouldn't have been killed. No, he shouldn't have. So, and that's and that's an interesting point because that, that fun fact or trivia is... Uh, it was about Helen and Barry specifically. So they're the, they say they're the only two of the four primary characters responsible for the death. Um, of the of the man and it, it says that they suffered deaths carefully covered in violent impact by flash editing which is true like when barry dies and when helen dies um it's that really rough cut back and forth cut back and forth flashing uh photography style killing right and the other mm -hmm. victims like max the officer elsa whatever they're just shown in full frame with the bloody effect like they're they didn't get a fancy ending 
So someone was trying to kind of loop together that, you know, Max and the officer and whoever else, they weren't really important kills. They were just kind of there. They got caught up at the wrong place, wrong time kind of a situation. But um, to me, it's far-fetched, though, because two of your people who, in my opinion, are totally guilty get away scot-free. Um, yeah. You know, they don't even lose an eye um, or a hand. But um, So, yeah, <clears throat> I, I agree with you about the kill, too, because it's – it's very forgettable, um, in my opinion. Like, he he didn't really get much, but oh, does he come back later to give you a good scare. So, <laughs> after Barry accuses Max, right, he then goes and decides to burn off some steam at the local boxing club. Mm-hmm. And then the killer plays with his head a little bit. Oh, I love this part. Ugh. This is This is great. Leaves the picture with the note, steals his car, and then <laughs> runs his ass down with it into the boxes. Right. Uh, so good. Um, you know, what's your favorite, just to, so I give you some time to talk here. I feel like I'm just steamrolling you, but what's Very your fine. favorite, uh, I guess, scene in this movie? Scene as a whole. Uh, it's the death of uh, our first teenager who was actually involved in the situation in the movie theater. Okay. So it's Helen, like, uh, Helen's death. Helen? No, no, no. In the movie theater. Um, <clears throat> in the movie theater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, who is it? Uh, Mr. Blonde and Beautiful. The uh, Curl oh, Backstreet Ryan. Boys locks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Barry. Okay. Yeah, Barry. Barry. Uh, Barry dies in the theater, doesn't he? Because he he's going in back to the projector room yeah. to find the the killer, and he just gets murdered there. And Sir Michelle Gellar's character is going, they're killing him, they're killing him. Everybody just surrounds and crowds her like to calm her down, and they don't even look. Yeah, this is what starts my favorite scene in the movie. It's, it's basically the transition between the two. Because Barry's whole job right then is supposed to be protecting uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar's character when she's up there handing off the pageant uh, tiara, right? Yeah, I forgot that that was a theater. Sorry, that's what threw me off. I'm thinking like movie theater. Um it's i guess it could be a movie theater but it also looks very similar to like a town hall kind of building you know what i mean like small town town hall i don't know just when you said theater it threw me off i started thinking i missed something um which is impossible because i've seen this movie way too many damn times to miss something um (laughs) so yeah so no that's a great scene because you're right i mean barry's up there at the top he's supposed to be watching her um, and protecting her, and instead he's the one who ends up getting killed in that scene. That's great. Um, he just gets stabbed to death. Nothing really special either. Probably like the weakest kill in the movie, um, just kill wise, because it, it's not. I don't know. It's not too too much. I don't know. Is it, do you like that scene primarily for the kill, or primarily just for um, there's what's going down? It's just so dumb because it's right, it's right there, and there's so many scenes like this in this film where there are people right there. They're being obnoxiously loud. They're pointing something out, but nobody's paying attention to what's going on, or believing anyone. Yeah, I wonder if there's a bit of social commentary that they were trying to put there. I I don't know because I mean, you know, like no one's listening to anyone when they're talking, or you know, because it's the cop too that calms down Helen, right? The cop comes in and he's like, hey, like, calm down or whatever. We'll figure it out. They go up there and they look and, oh, of course, everything's cleaned up and he's gone, right? I mean, Scary Movie does a great job of mocking Scream and I Know What You Did Last Summer very well. And I I just, I can't. I I guess I'm mixing up the theater and and Scary Movie with the the balcony on the, in the hall. I'm not sure. Like, I thought it was a theater. No, no, they're right. So he's up, well, he's up the stairs and you can very clearly see what's going on yes no i mean if anyone had actually looked up when when geller's character was yelling they could have easily seen the killer killing if Uh, someone started screaming he's killing him he's killing him and started pointing where the the murder was going on would you focus on the person or would you look where they were pointing uh, briefly i would totally go look where the where they're pointing for sure so little suspension of disbelief for us in the movie it's like turn around turn around Yep. Not going to turn around. Not going to turn around. So uh, just to take it back a little bit, I really love um, your perspective on that scene. That was That's great. 
um, the just to walk the story along, the girls decide to do some research on Davy Keegan. And this is where I was like, ah, very Scooby-Doo-esque. Um, so that's the boy that they think they killed. And, and a big struggle that I have with this is sometimes people start to put pieces together of things that aren't actually connected because you want to see those things. Like you want resolution, you want closure, right? So the girls then decide to go see David's sister, Melissa, which is played by Anne Hesch. So this is the actress I mentioned who I left out of the stars role because personally, I don't, I don't know if she um, was that big or is that big, but they cast her specifically because they really liked her for this specific role. Um, yeah. But in real life, Anne Hesch had sadly lost her brother to suicide, just like her character Misty thought that her brother David committed, committed suicide, even though the kids um, believed that they are the ones who hit and ran and threw him in the ocean and committed murder. So um, poor Anne, like, actually had lost her brother. So she related to this character heavily um, during filming. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so Missy, wanna, go ahead. I wanted to commentate on her acting. Like, I thought she was a very anxious, like, she did. She looked very anxious, and the way she kind of responded and reacted was just wonderful. She did a great job in this film. Yeah, I wonder right. if she took that emotion that she felt about her brother's loss, right, or losing her brother, and actually she's, put that in the movie. And she's been acting a lot longer than any of the other teenagers, the main cast, aside from uh, the forgettable death, the guy from Roseanne, and uh, third or whatever that terrible sitcom that everyone loves but it's bad if you take off the laugh track big bang um, theory yes Ugh. <laughs> no offense if you like big bang theory you do you you do you that's me um I'm but <laughs> she had a uh she's had a, a long and very successful career throughout her her life and i mean just the fact that i don't know who she does she is doesn't matter she's been in movies and tv shows yeah. whereas jessica love hewitt uh and Sarah um, the rest Geller. of the cast, Freddie Prinze Jr., Freddie Prince, yep. Sarah, and Sarah Michelle Gellar, the three of them haven't really done many movies aside from like just small things here and there. But this one, no, she she did a great job. Probably the best actor in the film. Yeah, I, I would definitely say, even though she wasn't in it a lot, she she definitely has a memorable performance for sure. Pivotal character, yeah. The, I mean, the whole cigarette is, scene. She, hey! She, yeah. hey! Bang! <laughs> That was kind of angry, though. You forgot your cigarettes. Well, because you got to remember, they said their car wouldn't start. It started just yeah. fine. And she heard it. And then she's like, oh, they've got their cigarettes, too. Those sons of bitches. You know, she, mm -hmm. in her mind, she's starting to think, like, you know, they're playing me. Something's not right here. And definitely, I think that emotion comes out when she hits that window. Hey! <laughs> right. So she is pivotal, too, because she mentions a friend came to visit after her brother uh, committed suicide named Billy Blue. And we're going to go ahead and put a pin on that at the moment, though, because it'll be more important later on. But she right. is super pivotal. So let's keep that in the back of our minds as we continue forward through the through the film synopsis. So, all right. So, so first time you see this film, you can tell where the uh, director is trying to point who the killer is. Like you, all the red herrings and everything. Uh-huh. And Creepy uh, smiles. you... you <laughs> You think she might be it? You think there's potential of her being the killer? You think there's potential of Freddie Prince Jr.'s character being the killer? But And you think Barry could potentially be the killer up until his death as well? Yeah. It, and, you know, I really loved your idea that you came up with um, of how to make this movie a little bit better even. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. if you want to talk about it live on, on the episode, but I just want to say yeah. like, that was a lot of fun. The idea was Yeah, really let's... Cool. Well, we watched this movie together and we had some live commentary going on. And I, I just said, Hey, you know, this movie would have been a lot better if they had kind of used the characters differently, make you question things a little bit more. And there's, there's, there's some twists that have been overdone. Like with scream, there's always multiple killers, except for, I think the third one, as we've talked about in our screen episode, <clears throat> but in this film, the killer is kind of a, is a surprise not because they allude to him, but because she's just there. They don't really point it out, but they give him good motivation. I would have liked it if we had multiple killers who didn't know who the other killer was, but was on guard and kind of 
you know, one of them was one of the teenagers or however you want to do it, that would have really kind of upped the ante for this film or any film. It'd be a good, uh, kind of a good idea. Yeah. The way you started breaking out though, like have Sarah Michelle Gellar's character and Freddie Prince's character, Helen and Ray, um, be actually trying to kill the entire group of friends, but not know that both of them are the killer at the same time. That right. piece was the piece I really enjoyed, like that idea, because there's scenes later on in this movie, like when Sarah Michelle Gellar's character gets chased, which is we're coming up to here soon. But when that scene happens, picturing it in my head as Freddie Prince Jr.'s character under that slicker. Oh, my God. Like that. That just like opened my eyes to so much better uh, possible scenery going on here. Like it was. Oh, man, I wish. Right. And Sarah Michelle kind of like, we don't see her die in that scene. We just kind of, it, it fades to black and then, well, it doesn't fade to black like the tires. She just kind of disappears yeah. with the killer. So if if she kind of showed up later to kill Freddie Prince Jr. and saves Sarah or Jennifer Love Hewitt's life on the boat, when Jennifer's like, you're the killer, it's you. And then Sarah shows up and she's like, I've been trying to tell her some whatever thing, give her a, a sense of false security and then they're safe and then maybe have some sort of scene where uh, similar to the usual suspects where she realizes, wait a second. And then she dies at the end. Yeah. I still know. It's totally, and it's totally easy to do because when Julie goes to meet, um, what's her faces, uh, to meet Missy again, uh, right. Helen is then being protected by Barry and Ray is off to do his own thing. So they're all basically separated when Barry gets whacked, nobody knows that he gets whacked. Sarah Michelle Gellar's character is in the cop car right after that. So she never gets to talk to Julie or Ray. So then Julie comes back and she goes to meet up with Ray right away. So like all that chaos and panic and everything is, is combined. And no one knows who's alive and who's dead at that moment. They don't know that anyone else is dead. So it was, oh, it was a very easy, could have been a very easy pit them against each other and have Sarah Michelle Gellar come out of nowhere moment uh, for sure. But um, yeah, maybe a remake is, is in order and maybe we can get that in there. Mm. Um, I know they're talking about doing a remake, so um, we'll see. Series, they, right? Um, well, I, it's weird because I've seen a couple of uh, like interviews or articles I read where uh, Jennifer Love Hewitt is asking not to be the mother of <laughs> any of the characters because they want her to come back as, you know, an homage to her original character. Um, but then on IMDb, we've seen the TV series potentially coming out in 2020, um, which would be kind of neat, but I, I feel like it would go down the Scream route as well, where they're just going to ruin it um, like they did Scream. But I don't know. Yeah, it. I'm, I'm interested. I'm definitely interested, because Kevin Williamson's writing is, is, in my opinion, still very, very, very phenomenal, and I think he can fix a lot of problems, but... Um, they butchered mm. it with Scream for sure, in my opinion. Okay, so Helen goes home after um, a long, hard day of Scooby-Dooing. And she finds her dad watching baseball and drinking. And you get this sense that she feels her dad's disappointed in her. And I get the sense that her dad definitely is, disapp is disappointed in her. Um, I don't know what you think about that scene. But it's just kind of weird, that scene. It's almost like filler because she has to come in and walk slowly and all that so the fishermen can get in the house and chop off her hair um but yeah i don't know do you have any opinion on that scene specifically no not really it's okay. is what it is yeah um it's funny though i don't know if that haircut is actually in the book i've never read the book um maybe some of our listeners could tweet at me and let me know if that's real or not in the book because sarah michelle geller dons that look in as buffy summers in the 97 98 second season of the show Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So I don't know if she did it for Buffy and then they had to put it in the movie or they did it in the movie so then she had to wear it in the show. But that's a you know, fun, fun I believe that. It was probably some other uh, some other studios like you gotta cut your hair and she probably had two things going on at the same time. Because she was in Buffy, Buffy at the same time she was doing this film, right? Uh, she was. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's how casting found her they wanted someone who was lovable uh but still could be a bitch so they picked buffy because she thought she they thought she portrayed that perfectly mm. so 
we'll move forward here. Julie gets a call from Helen, presumably telling her what happened the night before, right? The haircut. Um, right. As, as Julie's heading to her house, she starts to hear those noises in the back of the car. And this this is the scene I was talking about that's pretty damn good. Um, she finds Max's dead body in the trunk, which also gives us the best scene from Scary Movie. What are you waiting for? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's God. such a dumb scene, too. I get that she's freaking out, and that, but screaming and doing that, it's just, nah. Come on, it's a, bro. It's a, it's a bit over the top. Yes. So 100. John Galecki recalled doing a body cast for that scene where Julie opens the trunk to find his dead body in it and the crabs crawling out of his mouth and all that. Later on, he got a call from production, and they said that they had to shut down for the day because Jennifer Love Hewitt was so upset by seeing the dead body. So he called to reassure her that he was very much alive. Um, J- John and, and Jennifer Love Hewitt actually were very good friends at the time. They mm-hmm. lived together in the same apartment building when he was doing National Lampoon's uh, Christmas Vacation. So they actually became friends when they were very, very young. Um, and carried that friendship on throughout their careers. And she actually suggested him to be the role of Max. So that small time bit that he got turned into a little bit more when he got to get, you know, whacked by the killer because they weren't going to do it at first. Yeah. It was kind of a, well, they had to show some creepy guy and build up some sort of connection between the characters. And if they kept Max in kind of hinted towards him being the killer, maybe that would have worked out better for his character. Yeah, I'm wondering I don't know. what the role of his character is if he doesn't get killed, right? Because they went back and reshot that. So like you said oh. about the cutting room floor, I wonder if he had any role forward afterwards. I doubt it, honestly. Interesting. Uh, but that's – he probably knows the actor. <clears throat> yeah. We should we should uh, tweet at him and see if he'll come on the show as a guest sometime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Worth a shot. It doesn't hurt to ask. It does not. All right, so the then we get the parade scene, which is also the scene where Julie is um, going to find out more information about David Keegan. So they keep cutting back and forth between uh, those two events, right? So Barry tackling some random dude in a slicker, and then he's like, where is he? Um, and then we get Helen up on stage. She has to give the crown over, which is when we get the awesome um, sequence up in the rafter like you were talking about, and he gets stabbed to death. Um, but after that, that's when, in my opinion, my favorite scene of this movie, that's where, that's okay. where we're at right now. So, oh, really? Yes. It's Helen's Let's chase. Hear about it. It's her chase scene. So it starts mm. right then and there with the cop and it ends at the tires. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I was really surprised when I read a lot of these kind of interesting facts and fun, fun bits of information about it. Um, a lot of people in the the horror fandom actually think this is one of the best scenes in all of horror and slasher films. Uh, one of the best chase scenes, right? You get Helen starting out from getting out of the cop car. She then runs to the uh, to the the family store, and then I mean, her fear is so like I don't know believable. Yes. <clears throat> and then the bit of great cat- acting. The bit of cat and mouse that we get, I think, is perfectly timed. The jumping in the dumb waiter and trying to pull herself up real quick, falling out of the window just as the killer was getting to it. Um, but I think the like the crazy part to me is while the fireworks are going off for the big Fourth of July event, you get her kind of stumbling through the streets, and all these people are around. But like maybe they just think she's drunk, you know what I mean? And they don't really like bother her because then she goes in the she's... alleyway running and she's screaming in the in the alley right she's screaming yeah and she's limping yeah and she's limping yeah you talked about her limp which was great well let's Um, go back to the death of her her sister real quick the only yeah the only (laughs) the only death i think is really worth talking about sure that veronica well that veronica vaughn did did we go into this so she goes inside the uh the place where she works. Yep, she goes in the family she's store. Like, yep. Tells her sister to lock the door. Lock the and, door, god damn it. And so her sister goes back and you don't hear from her and she runs back there and we find her a corpse. Well, with, so uh, that's actually much which yeah. I, I wanted to uh, you know Chris Farley kind of comes in and he goes, "That Veronica Vaughn, me and her corpse got it on." 
And, you know, Sarah Michelle Gellar is like, no, you didn't. And he's like, you're right. But a killer friend of mine did. No. I'll I stop. Mean, it's good. It's good. We're gonna I'll leave. stop. So, well, you're the one who, who told me to bring it in. So It's perfect. <laughs> I, I like it. You didn't have to tell everybody that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so, so sorry, man, behind the curtain. So Elsa gets her throat slit. And I and I yep. love this kill, okay? Because it does one of my favorite ways to see a killer kill the victim. You get the reflection right. off of her glasses and her eyeball of the man in the slicker as he's going to do the kill. Now you don't get to see the kill. It is definitely kill it's an off scene off screen kill, but you get the blood slashing across the, the glass, right? And then we get to see the body later on when uh, Helen discovers the body. So definitely cool. Um, it is my favorite. Um, this is my favorite scene in the entire movie is the chase scene. But my favorite kill is her sister actually getting it at the front door when she was trying to lock it. A little too late, Elsa. Should have went to your castle. All right. She so should have let it go. She should have let it go. <laughs> so, yeah. So at the end of this sequence... Helen gets slashed to death in the alley between a bunch of tires. But to Clark's point, you don't really know she's dead. You never really know because they don't show it. Um, it's one of those not literally fade to black, but it's more like fade to fireworks in the parade. <laughs> and she's she's dead. Um, but yeah, at this point, we're you're basically at the end of the movie here, right? So this is where everything's going to make sense. All the bits and bobs and pieces that you might have been confused about. It's going to get resolved here in the next five, ten minutes. So if you don't want to get spoiled, maybe now's the time to stop the show. I'm already spoiled. Let's go. Julie has now pieced every bit together. Okay. And she rushes to who? Ray. She rushes to Ray. She wants to see, she wants to tell him and, and, and get everything kind of figured out. And then they're, they're going to go save the day because that's her boyfriend. But she actually notices that the <clears> boat, <throat> has the name Billy Blue written on it. And what does she do? Mm. She freaks the fuck out. Yeah, because he's wearing the he's wearing fisherman's garb. He's working as a fisherman. And she's like, what are you doing here? I work here. And then she runs off and he chases her. Yeah, but he acts all creepy too at the, at the boat yeah. door. He's like, just come with me. It'll be all better. Like, no, dude, that's not your... Mm -mm -mm. Nope. Freddie Prince may have realized it before she did, but... At this point, we don't know. So she yeah. runs from him, and Freddy gets clotheslined, or Ray gets clotheslined by some rando. Yeah, by some other random and, yeah. fisherman. Yeah, and, um, and he's like, get in the boat. She's like, I'm going to call the cops. He's like, no, get in the boat. You'll be safe in there. So he, and then she, she goes inside. She goes in the, yeah, inside. Yep. The creep haunt. Dude, this is my favorite quote in the movie, though. So this this fisherman delivers my favorite quote. Um, that's a shame, being that it's 4th of July and all. Like Kids like you should fun. be out having fun. Drinking, Drinking partying, party. running, people, running over, people over, getting away with murder, getting away things, with like murder. <laughs> things like that. Oh, this is it. Now you know. This guy knows way more information about these kids than you thought. And this guy has killed two people disconnected from the whole situation. He's killed, uh, he's killed Max and he's killed the police officer or the deputy or sheriff. And Elsa. And... Yeah, and Elsa. So you know he is just driven and hell bent on getting his revenge and does not care at this point. I mean, don't you you gotta understand that he's also covering it up though, because Elsa was there. She She's not doing know. a great job of it. <laughs> what are you talking about? All these bodies are in the ice storage on the boat. Yeah, they're on ice storage, but how how did he clean up after everything? Like he should have been caught in the in the friggin' balcony when he was murdering uh Barry. He hired the janitor from Scream. Uh, to clean up all the mess. Potentially. Wow. <laughs> Which is Wes Craven. Oh, that's so good. Um, anyways. Okay, so, yeah, I know. It, it's it's very unbelievable. Um, I give reprieve. I give reprieve mm -hmm. to that. I don't hold it too hard of a judgment against this movie, only because uh, I think it does so much... I think it does so much more if you let that go. Yeah, well, it's it's one of those films where you're supposed to watch it and enjoy kids getting killed. Yeah, but I mean, I pile, like, in my opinion, if there's too many pieces that just don't make sense, I let it topple over and it ruins the movie. Mm. And it's a bad movie to me. This one, I don't, I mean, I'd have to be really nitpicky to find other things I don't enjoy about it. 
Um, I'm not saying I don't enjoy it. No, no, I know. I'm, I'm just saying, like, with that, that's probably the biggest problem to me is I don't, it's not believable how the killer gets away with stuff, I guess. And and we've been talking about it throughout the whole episode. People should have seen him when he killed people. Right? Mm-hmm. Barry and Helen's kills alone, their deaths alone, should have been seen. Mm-hmm. You're in the alleyway. The parade is right next to you. How You're do you not screaming. See yeah. How do people you playing instruments are not that loud. They're not louder than people screaming. I, I'd understand it if they were, like, a bit further away. But it was right. She was, like maybe 12 feet away from people in the alley, if that, once she gets disappear. Yeah, I don't, yep. like I said, that's the one thing I just can't, I, you know, I can't uh, let it go. It definitely bothers me. Um, let it go, but <laughs> I'm just like, come on. Yeah, no. I know. I'm that person in the movie theater going, what? Look to your left. Don't open the door. Oh, no, I Whereas definitely I'm, open I'm the door. I'm the person who's like, hey, is uh, anybody there? Oh, yeah. You just walk in and everyone's dead at the end. Yeah, that's true. True. Follow us on Twitter 100%. if you haven't seen that tweet. So so <laughs> to round out this Instagram. movie, to round out this movie, uh, Ray and uh, Jennifer Love Hewitt's character, Julie, um, end up confronting the fisherman. Here's what, mm-hmm. here's what happened. So here's the big spoiler, okay? The fisherman, right, actually killed... David Keegan. That's the name, right? My screw. Yeah, Ben Willis killed David Keegan. Mm-hmm. He pushed him off the cliff. It's revenge for causing his daughter's death previously. Okay, that's that's your whole plot right there. Bam. Ben Willis actually killed David Keegan for David Keegan actually causing the death of his daughter. But when Bill, Ben Willis was done killing him, he was, you know, le, 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 walking home drunk or whatever on that crazy windy road, and the four kids hit him. They then, right. instead of just taking him to the hospital, they throw him in the water and assume he drowns and dies. They also thought he was dead. That's just, that was also a bit annoying. Um, but anyways, that's that's our whole, that's our big plot twist. That's our whole point. Um, and, and I mean, it's pretty good. It's believe that part's believable. I mean, that that definitely seems. When you believable. kill someone, make sure they're dead. You better make sure they're dead. Um, <laughs> and that's not the end of the movie, though. We get a little bit more. Um, we get a really, really fun 1990s ending to the film because your killer's never dead. Okay, if you didn't learn that from Scream, you're gonna learn it now. So back at Julie's college dorm, she's getting ready to get in the shower in a towel that barely is hanging on. I I might add. Um, and I don't know how they tied it. Okay. Clark asked me this. Um, I don't know how they tied that towel. Okay. But they tied it. Look, really no, well. they, they tied it to show off her cleavage. This whole movie is just showing off her cleavage. They're putting Sarah Michelle Geller in push up bras. They really want to showcase the, uh, the breasts. As much sex like, appeal as they could get. <clears throat> 100%. And I'm going to tell you, they nailed it. Okay. They nailed they it. They did. They did a good job of, of showcasing Jennifer Love Hewitt's boobs by t- tying the towel in such a way that would show off her cleavage. Because you can tell, like the way it was rolled, it was just done to showcase her boobs. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how it stayed on. Uh, <laughs> That's sex sells. But she's talking to Ray on the phone, and she receives some mail. A friend outside lets her know, "Hey, you got some mail or whatever." So then she's thinking it's a note. The way it's styled, it looks like it's a note from the killer. Um, she opens it. It's just an invite to a college party at a sorority later on. Uh, but then when she returns to the shower room, it's fully steamed up, and there's a message written on in the steamed glass saying, I still know. And then the killer breaks through to the credits. Roll yep. Up. Amazing ending. I think it's a lot of fun. I think it's very clever. Um, and it's I don't think it was expected, to be honest, in the theater. I think Now we're going to talk about <clears throat> the sequel, themselves. I Always Know What You Did Next Summer, I still which know. was made in 2006. No, no, no. The, that one doesn't count. We're talking about I always know. Oh. Did you know they even made that one? Yes. <laughs> and from what I've I've seen, because I've never watched it, from what I've seen, it's like a zombie version of him. Huh? Yeah, like pictures online. They have him. He looks like a zombie in I huh? Always Know. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. No, he's alive, but he just looks gross. Oh, okay. Interesting. Well, you shouldn't... Guys, just be original. 
So by the way, just, make- just just so you know, like I mean, all of our main characters are dead by this point. Yeah. Are all you of them. sure he's alive? He looks like a zombie in this picture. Ugh. I think he's alive. I just think he's gross. Yeah. I think he survived. <clears throat> okay. I um, would uh <laughs> don't watch it. Don't I would watch. hope they yeah, I have the yeah, I have the same image. I, I would hope they uh, remake this film and do it in a way where not everyone's makeup is extremely noticeable, where not everyone has perfect hair, where they don't, I don't know, showcase everyone's boobs. To... So basically you don't want a 90s movie? No, I want I want something real. I want... And I guess if you want to attract teenagers... Through sex appeal, um, I get the I get what this movie is. This is kind of Degrassi slash uh, Dawson's Creek with killing, which is probably why it's one of the highest grossing uh, horror movies of all time. But I would like to see a little bit less of that and a little bit more of raw human beings, just being people. You know, if if somebody's going to be poor and living in a small town, they shouldn't have perfectly feathered hair. Yeah, you know, I think. I think a remake could be done. It could be done really well. Um, even changing the story a little bit, like you were discussing earlier about the whole Helen and Ray thing. Doing yeah, I'd love that. Like that would be amazing, especially today, you know, in 2020, because it's not really expected. I tried to look up any other movie that was even similar to having two killers active at the same time in the same group of friends, but didn't know that they were each trying to kill the group of friends. And there's nothing out there. There's not a single film that does that. So I think that's something different that could be totally um, groundbreaking. Alien vs. Predator is probably the closest thing we have. Yeah, I just I don't I don't see that even remotely being the same. Only because they're not uh, I don't know they're not like they're Freddy vs. The Jason. Friends. Yeah, we talked about that one too a little bit. But um, but like we said, Freddy is uh, using Jason in that yeah, film. He's totally controlling Jason to get the souls. So I just I don't count it there either, but. I don't know. Yeah, I definitely would love to see a remake uh, done well. Obviously, mm-hmm. that's always the caveat, right? Um, if my... you uh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just thinking, yeah, if you kind of just follow the steps we listed, probably make something really good. <laughs> Small town killer friends killed killed someone. That's the main the main draw of the series. Is I know what you did last summer. Someone is following you. Someone knows but you don't know if they're going to try to kill you or not. You're, you're kind of on edge. And then once you have the first couple of kills, like they're, they have some sort of motivation. We don't know what it is, but you give it to multiple people and they're all trying to kill each other. Great. I mean, are you interested in the book at all based on the idea that, you know, none of them die in the book? I, I, I mean, I don't care if none of them die in the book as long as the book's written well, but horror stories are kind of... It's supposed to be a good book. Um, Definitely geared more towards the teens, early Mm -hmm. 20s. Um, But I I, I don't know. I'm just interested. Like, right now I'm reading It, so let me get through that first. But, yeah, I I don't know. I'm more interested in... uh... No, I'm more interested in seeing what what happens in the sequel with Brandy. I want to see how Brandy saves the day. And Jack Black. Jack Black's in the sequel. Oh fuck yeah! Oh yeah, he's I'm a, in. He's a Bob Marley stoner. It's so good. Okay, so he's playing himself. More himself, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. We'll throw it on the list. Um, Do it. Okay, so my last fun fact and trivia, right? I gave you a bunch of information throughout this episode. So um, the last piece that I have is about the the character Julie James. So I guess it's two pieces of information, but um, our one of our favorite actresses in, in horror, um, and and I'm not really sure where it comes from, where it stems from, right? We all loved her in Halloween Four, um, Halloween Five, but Danielle Harris. Uh, was actually considered for the role of Julie James back in uh, 1997. Mm. So she almost uh, maybe could have done this role. Um, Okay. uh, That's just a bit of fun fact for you horror junkies out there like myself and Clark. Um, The other piece that's kind of funny is 
Um, these main four characters, so we got Ryan Philippe, Jennifer Love Hewitt, Sarah Michelle Gellar, and Freddie Prince. The middle name of all three of their kids is James. And no one really knows if it's in like is a homage to Julie James, the character that they all four played in the movie together with, which is Jennifer Love Hewitt's character. Um, but it is very interesting that they all have um, James as the middle name for their kids. It's kind of mm. just a little bit of fun fact there for you. James is a very common name. Yeah, I'd say so. Okay, well, let's go ahead and end the synopsis segment and move on into what have you been up to lately, pal, buddy, guy? Oh, man, I'm <clears throat> I'm up to all the things. I am working really hard. I am trying to – I've been focusing a lot on cooking lately. I made a really good uh, chili. If you have the book, if you've heard of the – there's a good ingredient book for those of you interested – a recipe book called Thug Kitchen. It's a vegan cookbook. You don't have to be. You don't have to make everything vegan. That's in the cookbook if you don't want to. I generally replace some of the things with omnivorous items. Uh, I made like the chili I made. It's like pumpkin chili. I just added some bison beef in there, like a pound of it. It was fantastic. And I've been focusing a lot on my my knife game, all that stuff. So just having a lot of fun. That's amazing. I love it. Uh, when you sent me info about your chili, I was really excited. I can't wait to try it. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess I guess I gotta make more. Oh yeah, you do. Cool. You son of a bitch. I'm in. <laughs> well, like I, I kind of mentioned already, I've been reading um, it, the novel. Um, really enjoying it so far. The um, you and I talked really in depth during our phone call. You, actually, you haven't um, gotten to the. You got to the orgy part already, then. So you're past the orgy, I'm assuming. No, no, I haven't. The well, so you're not past the childhood part, then. No, it's I'm right now in um, Stu, Stu. Yeah. Stanley. Oh, Stanley. S Stanley's bath. Oh, so y then you should have read about the orgy then. No, chapter three was Stanley's bath. I don't. I don't know how they. Uh, it's very weird. How they kind of list up. things up. Yeah. Well, you'll you'll know when you get to it. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. It's definitely something everyone brings up um, whenever you talk about it, the novel. Um, it's the way it's written. Even if you know it's going to happen, when you start reading it, you're like, "Wow, wow, thank you." So Stephen oh, King has Stephen. a really, really weird way of describing uh, genitalia. Uh, I've, I've already seen it just in, in bits of this book and other books that he's written. Um, I don't know what his infatuation is with it, but we've gone He does a really good job of empathically creating these characters and making them extremely relatable. I, I would say this is probably one of his best books, if not the best. I still like The Stand the most, but this is great. Nice. You're in for a treat. Well, I am in for a treat. Uh, of course, this is May 12th when I am talking about it. I've already tweeted about my journey uh, so far um, on our social media, which is a great segue. Do it. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the number two guys horror pod. That once again is the number two guys horror pod on Instagram and Twitter. And if you'd like to email us, reach out to us, give us suggestions, request to be on the show, you could do so at the Gmail account, two guys and some horror at gmail.com. That is the word, two guys and some horror at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, we're going to bid you all adieu and just say thank, thank you, you for listening. Yeah. Thank you for being a part of our family. You're all beautiful. I don't know if I've said this before, but. I am just so attracted to you, and I thank you so much for listening to us. You have a wonderful day. Peace.